The Bob Murphy Show, episode 62. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. In this episode, I am going to pose some tough questions for progressives. Now, I want to be clear here. The point of me doing this is not to do a mic drop or a gotcha or zing, take that, guys. That's not what I'm trying to do here. So, of course, I'm not a progressive. I'm a libertarian. And so I think these questions are pretty provocative. And I think a lot of them, at least, are hard to answer. I don't think they're mere uh, word games here, just little mental puzzles, but pose genuine problems for what I perceive to be the typical progressive mindset. Let me say everybody's unique and any particular progressive on some of these distinctions or categories I'm going to raise might say, no, that doesn't pose a problem for me at all. I've always said blah, 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 blah. Okay, but many self-styled progressives haven't been consistent on that particular issue. All right, so again, I'm not saying every one of these applies to every single self-described progressive, but certainly each of these applies to the, quote, typical progressive. And let me lastly say in these caveats, my goal with this is not to transform a progressive into a libertarian. For one thing, you know, that would be futile. You're getting shelled with what you're going to perceive to be perhaps as a tax, and so you're going to go in defensive mode and uh, bottle up, and that's fine. That's understandable. We all do that. I do want to give you food for thought, though, so that at the very least, your understanding of your own policy positions, let's say, is more internally consistent and thoughtful. And that's really the most anybody can hope for in something like this. So without further ado, here are my tough questions for progressives. So let's start with this slogan from the abortion debates, my body, my choice. And let's just go ahead and stipulate that for the sake of argument. Okay, I'm not going to attack that head on and try to argue that that's not a valid principle the way many religious people who are culturally conservative would, let's just stipulate for that, for the sake of argument, that principle, right? And so what, what are we saying? We're saying that your autonomy, your decision over what is to be done to your body, that that is so important, sacred even perhaps for some of you, that any sort of offshoot implication of your choices on the rest of society, on social welfare, let's say, is secondary, that no matter how much you can try to demonstrate that a woman's choice over what to do with her body with respect to her you know, reproductive decisions, it's, it's not enough for some right winger to come along and point out all of these allegedly bad things that would happen to others in such a scenario that no, the woman's choice is really sacrosanct. Okay, let's take that as an established principle. So now my question is, why wouldn't you apply that Consistently, it seems to me that's just about the only area in life in America right now where progressives adhere to this principle of my body, my choice. For example, let's take seatbelt laws. How can the government tell me I need to wear a seatbelt? Isn't it my body, my choice? You might think that's frivolous. Okay. What about if I have cancer and want to take an experimental drug and the FDA says, no, you're not allowed to because it might, might kill you. <laughs> I say I'm dying of cancer. I want to take it. And the FDA doesn't let me. Shouldn't I be able to do that? Isn't it my body, my choice? And so if you agree, yes. Okay. So I hope you agree then that the FDA should not be in the business of denying potentially life-saving drugs, new experimental drugs to people who are terminally ill. But again, it's this principle. Why not push it further? Why should the FDA have any power to dictate, let's say, adults what they can do with with certain drugs. It's their body, their choice, right? So I would hope you would agree that, yes, if we're going to enshrine this principle, 
if a if a woman is competent enough to know whether a fetus should be brought into the world as a baby or not, isn't she also competent to know whether the possible benefits outweigh the possible risks or downsides of taking a particular drug? And if you're saying she's not competent to make that latter decision, well, doesn't that then cast doubt upon her competence to determine whether this new baby is to be born? What about having a market for kidneys? My body, my choice. If there's a woman who, you know, she weighs the pros and cons and says, I could really use whatever it would be, $15,000 right now, $20,000, don't know what the actual market price would be for a healthy kidney, but let's say it's something in that ballpark and she weighs the pros and cons and says, yeah, it would, it would really help my family a lot to get $15,000 I've consulted with medical professionals and they say with one remaining healthy kidney, I should have a decent life still. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Who is the government largely consisting of old white men, right? Who are they to tell her? No, no, no. You're not competent to make that decision. You may think that your family could benefit from that extra $15,000 more than you not having the kidney or what you would get from that kidney. But nope, you aren't allowed to make that choice. Again, if it's my body, my choice, why doesn't she get to cite that principle in that particular scenario? Other examples that are more obvious, perhaps, the military draft, right? The government right now is telling 18-year-olds they got to register for the selective service. Can't they say, my body, my choice? And you certainly can't say, well, you know, on the off chance there's a, ba a big war, we need to invoke the right to send you to the front lines. No, just like if there's a fertility emergency, doesn't matter. The government cannot order women to have babies. And likewise, how can the government possibly have the right to tell young men, here's a rifle, go get shot at and go kill some people. Do it for your country. How, how can that be a thing? Here's a question for you. There's a company and it's going to have a monopoly, right? So it's going to be the only company in the city, let's say, that's able to sell this particular type of product. And now you're going to, I'm going to give you a choice. What do you want the product to be? It's either going to be toothpaste or food. Okay. So again, company's going to have a monopoly on the provision of a good for a particular city. What do you want it to be? Would you rather the company has a monopoly on all the toothpaste sold in the city or the company has a monopoly on all the food that's sold in a city? Okay. You've made your choice. Now convince yourself or elaborate upon it to yourself as to why you made the choice that you did. Just, you know, you don't have to take a half an hour, but just but go through the motions, humor me, and actually say out loud or think through in your head in full sentences exactly why you made the choice that you did. And I'm, I'm guessing your choice was pretty obvious. You didn't need to think too hard about it. So now I'm saying don't just do it automatically. I want you to stop and ask yourself why and think through why. Okay. Now that you've done all that, do you think it's a good idea that right now we let the government have a monopoly on the police for a city? Just think back to what your reasoning was. I have another question regarding the police. When it comes to shootings, like mass shootings, for example, typically a progressive will respond to that by calling for gun control, right? We need to limit the ability of people to handle this weapon that was used in this crime. Yet whenever the police shoot someone incorrectly, right? Like it's on video and everybody on both sides, even the police union agrees. Yep, that should not have happened. That was a mistake. Why is the typical response from progressives not to say, let's disarm the police? Clearly, they can't be trusted with these types of weapons. But in, And the, the response is not to just say, let's ban those weapons, including from the hands of the police, which is you know how they respond when a civilian shoots someone wrongly with a weapon. But instead, there's calls for training, better training of the police officers. That's what we need. They need to be uh, exposed to you know, different types of uh, nationalities who might live in the neighborhood, that sort of thing. They need to broaden their cultural experience. Why, why is that? When there's a mass shooting, the typical progressive calls to ban the weapon in question. When the police shoot someone wrongly, the typical progressive does not call for moves that would keep guns out of the hands of police, but instead just calls for better training of the shooters. Why that mismatch? If Texas seceded, 
and we can make it as lopsided as you want. Let's say 90%, they have a referendum and there's a huge turnout and 90% of the people who vote, vote for Texas to secede. And that represents 60%, 70%, let's say, of the adult population. Would you be okay with that? Or would you want the federal government to use military force to prevent them from doing so? One of the central tenets of the progressive worldview is faith and belief in democracy, is the ultimate political system. And yet, when there's a vote that people don't like, Progressives often deride that as an example of populism. And just, just think about that, that in the typical progressive narrative, democracy is basically sacred, whereas populism is derogatory. It's a derogatory term. And yet the two are quite similar. So what's, what's the distinction? Is, is democracy really meaning if people vote for the candidate that the progressive wants, or is there something deeper? For example, suppose Trump gets Americans all riled up over CNN. Like maybe they run some really egregious article that makes a bunch of unsubstantiated allegations and then it comes out three days later that the primary uh, complainant, actually the primary source on that story, admits that, oh yeah, yeah I, I just was offered a bunch of money by the Democrats and, and I made it all up. And then, like, then they figure, they conclude, yeah, this really was a, a fabricated story. So in the heels of that, Trump gets the public all riled up and he has a referendum on whether CNN should be allowed to exist as a news corporation. And the public votes 70% in favor of shutting down CNN and 20% opposed and 10% don't know. I'm guessing if Trump went ahead to do that, you would say that was a violation of democracy. That was undemocratic. And yet in the scenario I've painted, the people overwhelmingly supported the move. So again, I ask, is democracy really what you mean when you talk about the ideal political system or are you using that word to stand for other things that really don't mean majority rule? Progressives will often defend energy efficiency mandates, right? Regulations coming down from Washington that increase the minimum performance, operating efficiency, energy efficiency of certain appliances, for example, or they might put in mandates on building codes to put better insulation in, to have uh, windows that retain heat better, so forth. And so progressives will defend these not only by reference to climate change, but they will also often say, hey, and the beauty of these regulations, these efficiency mandates, is that they pay for themselves, right? So don't listen to these right-wing crybabies talking about compliance costs and it's going to hurt GDP. No, no, no. These regulations they save you money in the long run because they lower your electricity bills. And so they pay for themselves. So it's not going to be harmful economically. If you think that, then why do the companies need to be forced to save money? If they were just ignorant, maybe they just didn't know about it. Never occurred to them to see if buying different light bulbs would lower their utility bill. But you, the progressive activists, know this to be the case. It's on the surface, that's unusual, isn't it? That you know more about saving the company money than the CFO does, but maybe you do. Why do you need to vote for politicians who will then appoint regulators who will enforce such regulations on biz? Why don't you just email the relevant material to the CFO of the company? Right? I mean, wouldn't he want to save the company money? Or is it that businesses in general do what's most profitable except if it might also help the environment, in which case they purposely lose money just to spite the planet. Regarding CAFE standards, corporate average fuel economy standards, how many miles per gallon the fleet of cars has to get in order to satisfy federal regulations, there is a trade-off, or at least many analysts believe there to be a trade-off in terms of higher fuel efficiency, miles per gallon, and how many traffic fatalities there are. And the principle involved is that, well, if a company has to make its vehicle more fuel efficient, has to get more miles per gallon, one way that it can move towards that goal is to make the vehicle lighter. And that's how, you know, it can get more miles per gallon. It's the engine has to burn less fuel to 
accelerate an object that's less massive, right? Make it lighter. Now, you might agree, okay, that's, that's possibly a thing, but come on, it's probably not a big deal. And so I'm asking, all right, now that you understand the principle, decide for yourself what number of fatalities would be an acceptable loss, right? How many extra motorist deaths per year or over a 20-year horizon, whatever way you want to think of it, would you say is acceptable to achieve the, you know, the environmental gains and the reduced reliance on fossil fuels, which was the original rationale? And then I would encourage you to look in the show notes page, bobmurphyshow.com slash 62, and look at some of the links I'll provide and see if the numbers you see described in the literature are higher or lower than what you picked as you know, your, your maximum level, the number of fatalities above which you would say, geez, that's, that's actually costlier than I thought. Maybe I don't support cafe standards anymore. Incidentally, for those who are curious, the reason I'm not just saying a number is it's, it depends what studies you look at. So if I say a number, people are going to quibble with the number, but that's why I want the listener to just pick a number that you're saying, okay, if that, you know, that's, that would clearly be unacceptable and then go look at the, the estimates in the literature and you'll see if the range that they provide is above or below your critical threshold. When it comes to the ostensible male-female pay gap, which as of 20, I think it's either 2018 or 2019, the numbers I was looking at, is estimated to be about 79 cents, right? So the average woman makes 79 cents to the average man's dollar in the United States. All right, and that's the pay gap. That's the raw pay gap. So here's my question. If you think that that is largely due to discrimination that's unjustified, that's irrational, and that it really does make sense to say that a woman gets paid 79 cents for the, the same work that a man gets paid a dollar for, then why don't more women open more firms? And if you think that that's so, because they can't, because there's sexism, okay. There are plenty of firms right now owned by women, right? Do you think they're all making above average profits? Because shouldn't they be? Why wouldn't they just hire nothing but women? Because again, you're saying they can get the same work done at a lower price. So why don't they hire women and pay them, let's say, 90 cents for the amount of work that other firms are paying some women 79 cents for, and they should still be able to undercut firms that employ mostly men because those firms have to pay those men a dollar for the same work. Going a different way, isn't it interesting that all these male employers are such suckers? Instead of looking at it as them underpaying women, aren't they overpaying men? They can get women to do a certain job for 79 cents, and yet they're over here paying men to do it for a dollar. Again, it's interesting that these blood-sucking corporations who will do anything for a buck not only apparently won't help the environment, even if it's profitable, by installing LED lighting and so forth and better insulation, but apparently they place their camaraderie with their male colleagues above profitability also. Because again, if I understand your worldview, you're saying the typical firm is hiring paying women 79 cents to do a certain type of work and they're paying men simultaneously a dollar to do the same work. So especially if it's a bigger company that employs hundreds of people, that would add up pretty fast, wouldn't it? Why wouldn't the company, I'm not saying the company would just hire all women, but why wouldn't it shift? According to your worldview, is it possible that they could gradually, they wouldn't have to do it with actual firings or layoffs, they could just, through attrition, but shouldn't there be a much higher premium placed on hiring women? And again, it's, it's not like just some vague illusion or appeal to fairness. If you're right, this could have huge consequences immediately for the bottom line. So again, it's interesting that these firms that would shut down factories and outsource them to uh, other countries, they'd be willing to do that, but they wouldn't be willing to shut down a factory right now and move it somewhere and hire a bunch more women domestically. Like that would be too inconceivable and out of the box thinking, and no, no, they would never do that. That's too much effort. That's too much of a pain. But instead, they'll shut down factories and ship them overseas to reduce labor cost. That doesn't seem to add up. 
I've seen a lot of people on Twitter who are part of what they call the Yang Gang. That's the hashtag. Meaning they're supporters of Andrew Yang. And in particular, they like his idea of UBI, Universal Basic Income. And I have always seen it described as a system that's going to be good for everybody. Right? It's not just a, it's not just like a welfare payment. It's more of like an insurance system, a safety net that's there for everybody and everybody benefits from. And that's why even upper income people should be glad to join the Yang gang and vote him in because we can see that these benefits, having more job security or, or income security, I should say, and so people aren't terrified of losing their job and they don't, they're not stuck in dead-end jobs. The creativity that that would unleash would more than pay for any frictions or any uh, systematic lopsided transfer that is involved such that everybody should be willing to support this idea. Right, And that's why these people are going to vote for Andrew Yang and bring this great idea to the country. So here's my question. Suppose Yang doesn't get the nomination or suppose he gets it and loses to Trump. What's to stop you guys from voluntarily implementing your own UBI yourselves among the Yang gang? Right, Nothing's stopping you from doing that. You can come up with what you want the basic level of support to be. You know, What's the check every month, for example? And then you figure out you know, how many of you there are and, you know, how much you need to contribute and, uh, you know, play with the numbers to get to work out right. But, you know, keep in mind, the higher you set that level, if more and more people drop out and stop working, there's going to be less income there for you to be able to tap into to put into the common pot. So just, you know, keep those effects in mind. But, you know, draw the circle around all the people who are in the Yang Yang want to participate and just run the numbers and come up with it. And then if... Your guy doesn't win. Don't worry. You can still implement the UBI among yourselves. Now, it wouldn't be as good as doing it for the whole country. I, I grant that. But surely, if it makes sense for the whole country to do it, surely it still would make sense for you guys to do it internally. I mean, there's going to be thousands of people who are diehard Yang supporters, right? So why not implement it among all, whatever, 30,000 of you? I don't know what the number is. Let's say it's 30,000. Really hardcore Yang supporters, why don't you implement UBI among yourselves? Because remember, Andrew Yang can't do UBI for North America. He can only do it for the United States. So if you're supporting him strongly, you think implementing a UBI system just for a portion of the people who live on Earth, namely the United States, is a good idea. Okay. So why wouldn't it be a good idea just among the Yang supporters, that subset of the population? And so go ahead and do it. What's, what's stopping you? I don't understand... I mean, I can understand first thing, well, if we're going to focus on getting him elected, but I'm saying if that doesn't work, don't you have this amazing fallback where you can all just join a UBI program yourselves and show us how good it is? I mean, think about that. That'd be a great social experiment. Economists would love that if you all just implemented the program and we could just track it and see what happens, see if it works. I mean, Andrew Yang's all about, he's empirical and scientific and rational, right? So I think he would like this and have a great thing. I mean, that would make him popular for the next election too, right? If you guys implement it, you could show the world. That'd be amazing. So go ahead and do it. Hey folks, let's take a quick break from my tough questions for progressives to reiterate that if you like the show and you want to see more episodes, by all means, contribute. Go to bobmurphyshow.com slash contribute and you'll see the special offers I have available just for you. Here's a question I have for progressives. If you support a large increase in the minimum wage or you support what you call a living wage, you know, things like $15 an hour or higher, why stop there? Why not call for a minimum wage of $50 an hour, right? That would do so much more good. Now, I know you've heard that before, right? That's the first argument a libertarian type will deploy on Twitter. But I'm just asking you, so I'm not, I'm not saying that that's the end of the argument, right? If somebody says, oh, I believe in uh, drinking orange juice every, every morning. That's what I do. And then says, oh, well, why don't you take 16 gallons and shove it down your throat? You're saying that's a good idea? That, no. So in general, just exaggerating whatever the proposal is to the point of absurdity, that's, that's not a deal breaker. That's not a crushing argument. But in the case of the orange juice, a nutritionist could actually explain quite clearly and say, well, no, here, here's why 16 gallons would be detrimental, but 
one glass in the morning might be better than zero glasses in the morning. And here's why. And da, 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 right. And they could explain the physiology of the body, depending on how much of an in-depth discussion you wanted. And there actually would be a reason that past a certain point, you know, a little bit of orange juice is better than none. But at some point, additional volume of orange juice in the morning is bad. Okay. And they could give you a reason for that. So here too, I, I'm not intending this to be the end of the discussion, but I want you to actually think through why would $50 an hour be bad? And I'll tell you partly why I'm asking is because a lot of times when I listen to you progressives explain the benefits of a $15 an hour minimum wage or a $20 an hour living wage, that kind of thing, the benefits you list do not at all take into account any downsides. So when you say, oh, I support this policy because, and you start listing all the reasons, everything you say would be better if the minimum wage were $50 an hour, the living wage were $50 an hour. So that's what, partly why I'm asking the question, that you're clearly not, when you initially support it and say, this is why it's a good idea, you're just listing the pros. You're not listing any of the cons. So presumably for your policy, I mean, I'm hoping for one thing, most of you agree <laughs> that, yeah, $50 an hour minimum wage would be bad. I guess if you're saying, no, it'd be good, then you're at least consistent. And it's just you and I have a much different view of how the economy works. But I'm assuming the progressive listening to this has an answer for why $50 an hour is bad. And by the way, you can't just say, oh, well, that's silly. Come on. We're not talking about 50. We're talking about 20. You're not allowed to do that. I'm saying, no, you specifically have to say, why is $50 an hour bad? And then when you do, notice that those reasons you gave are probably also applicable when you increase the minimum wage from $7.25 to $15 an hour or $20. It's just they're not as severe. And so presumably for you to say, I'm in favor of raising it to $15, but not to $50, there must be some benefits from it and some costs. Just talking like an economist, but this is a pretty clear-cut example of where that language is quite relevant and appropriate. Or let's call them pros and cons if you like. There's some pros and cons, and the pros outweigh the cons going from 725 to 15, but going from 15 to 50, you think the cons outweigh the pros, okay? And that's fine, but I'd like you to just keep those costs in mind now when you're arguing with people about it, because again, it's a, it's a bad situation. There's not much constructive dialogue going on when you're saying this is a good idea because, and you just list the reasons that it's good and don't list the downsides. It's hard for the discussion to proceed. While I'm on this topic, let me also just mention, I'll put links in the show notes page. So again, this is bobmurphyshow.com slash 62, that you might hear people defending these things. Oh, don't listen to the economists who tell you they won't cause job losses because the, the literature shows that's not true. What the literature shows is that a small increase in the minimum wage in under some settings and, you know, according to some studies, does not have a significant affect unemployment, all right? So that by itself does not show if you doubled the minimum wage, what would that do to employment? And again, remember, the whole point of this exercise was I was showing you at some point, the thing that makes the policy good when you do it a little bit turns around and becomes bad when you do too much of it. So there, the fact that the empirical results are talking about like a 10% increase to the minimum wage rate and then what does that do to employment? That does not at all extrapolate into what would happen if you doubled it. Because we already know if you increased it by a factor of uh, what six, that you're agreeing with me. Yeah, that would be a bad idea. And you didn't, you didn't need to look at the empirical literature to know that. What if babysitters were decided by popular election, right? Like when you voted for your mayor for your town or your city, what if you also had to vote for all the people that were going to be babysitters and then they were randomly assigned to households. That could be a Black Mirror episode, couldn't it? So why do we pick the mayor that way? If you're in favor of redistributing income from the top 1% to everybody else, do you want to apply that principle globally so that the top 1% of income earners on planet Earth have to have their income distributed to the bottom 99% of Earthlings? Did you know that the New York Times on May 29th, 2012, ran an article that was on the front page with the title Secret Kill List, and kill list is in quotation marks, proves a test of Obama's principles and will. 
And what this article is talking about is that the president of the United States has a secret list of people whom the military can kill, like with drones, with no judicial oversight. They can be even U.S. citizens. And they're just on that list because the president and his advisors decided that person is someone who ought to be killed. Do you know about that? Isn't it weird that people didn't make a bigger deal out of that? And if it really wasn't on your radar, should you maybe get some other people into your Twitter feeds and whatever else you do to stay on top of things? Maybe should you include people that wouldn't have let something like that pass by without remark? I'm going to play a clip of Obama talking about some uh, mistakes that were made in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Just take a listen. With respect to the larger point of the RDI report itself, even before I came into office, uh, I was very clear that in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, we did some things that were wrong. We did a whole lot of things that were right, but we tortured some folks. We did some things that were contrary to our values. I understand why it happened. I I think uh, it's important when we look back to recall how afraid people were after uh, the Twin Towers uh, fell and and the Pentagon had been hit and the plane in Pennsylvania had fallen and people did not know whether more attacks were imminent uh, and there was enormous pressure uh, on our law enforcement and our national security teams to try to deal with this. Uh, And... You know, it's important for us not to feel too sanctimonious in retrospect about the tough job that those folks had. And a lot of those folks uh, uh, were working hard under enormous pressure and are real patriots. But having said all that, we did some things that were wrong. So, my question suppose. The CEO of Walmart is replaced by someone else. And he comes out and has a press conference and says, yeah, it turns out um, some of our employees in the past few years ago, they were, uh, yeah, they were taking, they were taking cat food and and selling it as tuna fish for human consumption. And, uh, you know, they they did it to, uh, to, to make some money. And, you know, we got to understand they were just trying to do what was right for the shareholders. And uh, yeah. But I I don't really think dwelling on the mistakes of the past are appropriate. And let's just try to move on and go forward from that. How how would you feel about that as progressive? Would you be okay with that company's internal investigation that just moved on? Would it bother you that the company had sold cat food as tuna fish to its customers and some employees did this thing and the new CEO didn't want to punish anybody? There were no heads that were going to roll. Just going to move on and then talk about let's let's not really judge these people too harshly. Who are we? You know, the, com- the company was in dire straits there financially for a bit and jobs were at stake. And really, you can't blame them for doing what they did. But I do acknowledge it was wrong. They should not have put the cat food into the tuna cans intended for human consumption. Would you feel comfortable with that person being in charge? If greenhouse gas emissions really do threaten humanity itself, like if our grandchildren, great-grandchildren are a genuine risk of true peril because of greenhouse gas emissions, like that's how serious you are about this threat, then why aren't you supporting nuclear power passionately? As you may know, the popular climate target now is 1.5 degrees Celsius and failing that, because that's kind of an ambitious goal, clearly total global temperature increases have to be capped below 2 degrees Celsius. I mean, that's just a given now, the way the UN talks and many... uh, Climate activists talk about these issues. Now, you may also know that William Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize for economics back in 2018 for his pioneering work on the economics of climate change. So given that what the UN is putting out as the recommended goal is definitely under 2 degrees Celsius and as close to 1.5 C as possible, and William Nordhaus who uh, co-authored a text with Paul Samuelson, by the way, so this is by no means a a right-winger, Nordhaus. 
He wins the Nobel Prize for his work on climate change. His model was one of three that was selected by the Obama administration's EPA and other groups when they calculated the so-called cost of social cost of carbon. Okay, so again, this Nordhaus's model is definitely top flight, state of the art. What do you think in his model, and I'm referring to the DICE 2016 runs, the model's name is DICE, what do you think in his model's runs the optimal amount of warming to allow is? And by the way, in his simulations, if the world does nothing, if, if governments do nothing, he thinks total cumulative global warming would be something like 4.1 degrees Celsius, okay? So given that the UN thinks it should be below 2, ideally not much above 1.5 C, Nordhaus's model says it'll be about 4.1 C. This is by the year 2100, by the way. Um, warming, if we quote do nothing or the baseline, what do you think Nordhaus's model recommends as the optimal amount of warming to allow? Because there's a trade-off involved. If you're too stringent, you know, you, you really make transportation and electricity more expensive, right? So you, you wouldn't want to have zero more warming because then that, you know, civilization would grind to a halt. All right. So what do you think? How do you think Nordhaus's model spits out what that alternative is, what the trade-off is, the right way to balance it? Just guess. It's actually uh, 3.5 degrees Celsius is what Nordhaus's model says is the optimal amount of warming to allow. And again, this is the guy got the Nobel Prize last year and his model was one of three the Obama administration EPA used. Isn't that surprising? My point is not that his model is correct, but if you're a climate activist, did you, did you know that? Like, isn't that unusual? And if anything, or at the very least, I should say, are you skeptical now of the Nobel Committee? Isn't that odd that if they're holding up someone's work that you must think is totally wrong if you support the UN's targets? Then do you not trust the Nobel Committee at least now? Again, it's not the same thing as the Nobel and the natural sciences. What about the Paris Climate Agreement? I remember when President Trump said he was going to pull the U.S. out of that. There was a lot of consternation which would lead you to believe that if only the countries stayed in the agreement and lived up to their pledges, we'd be fine. And so on that note, my question is, what do you think an organization relying on standard models when it runs the simulations and says, if all the countries of the world met what their current Paris pledges are, including the United States, right? What the United States pledged. If all the governments of the world met those pledges, that they've already given for the Paris Agreement, what do you think the standard modeling shows is the probable temperature increase? Just go ahead and guess. And remember, the UN says we absolutely have to limit warming to below 2 degrees Celsius. The answer is 2.9 degrees Celsius is what the pledges all say. If you look at what governments actually have implemented to date, the projected warming is 3.2 degrees Celsius. All right, so my question is, at what point would you admit that a political solution to climate change isn't working? If our political process allows Donald Trump to become president, why do you want the federal government in charge of health care? If someone who's, in many respects, Hitler-esque can take power, do you want that person deciding whether your grandma gets a kidney transplant? The Flint water crisis, many people say, proves that Republicans are heartless. But doesn't it prove that you don't want the government in charge of your water? What did the residents do in the immediate aftermath? They had to rely on getting bottled water that's produced by private companies. And so can we at least agree that when you buy water from a, a private company, you're not worried about it being poisonous? And even if you did buy it, right, let's say some company foolishly just loaded up its bottles with water that would make kids sick, how long would that situation last? Wouldn't it be ended almost immediately once kids started getting sick if that company didn't take immediate action to prove the community, oh, wow, we, we identified the problem, we fixed it, holy, here's months worth of free water, we're so sorry. If they didn't really show that they fixed the problem and they kept giving them water that was making their kids sick, that company would go out of business, wouldn't it? Here's my last question for you. If you're a progressive who looks at red state America with a sort of 
occasional contempt, perhaps, but more, you just feel sorry for those people. They just don't, I mean, they're not as educated as you are. Let's, let's be frank. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody or anything, but let's, let's just be real here. You're more educated than them. You know how the world works. You're, you have reliance upon all sorts of peer reviewed studies. You know, the best practices and what you're going to do in the long run is better for these people, even if you kind of have to use a little bit of coercion. You're going to use the the bare minimum possible, but ultimately, yeah, if people don't see the benefits of Obamacare, well, then they should be forced against their will to buy health insurance. So my question is, now that you've gone through that train of thought, can you understand how the British officials who ran colonies felt? You see that that's the same mindset? All we're saying is give peace a chance. You've just experienced another episode of The Bob Murphy Show, the podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. For more information and to subscribe to this podcast, visit bobmurphyshow.com.